to matters at hand. It is an immense pleasure to welcome so many partners today, uh, colleagues from universities, uh, government, companies and charities. But the group that I'm perhaps most delighted um, to welcome here today are teachers and our colleagues from schools and colleges, because they are the ones who are faced with sort of the everyday pressures of teaching, planning, managing, marking, and leading in their institutions. So many of them have taken the time to be here today. Teachers and the systems that they use to support students are central to our work at Causeway. Uh, and working with teachers is the main theme of my remarks this morning. Uh, and I'm really happy to say that the teachers will round off our proceedings today by leading our final plenary. There are three questions which I'd really like to address today. Firstly, and obviously, given the theme of the conference, why should we as colleagues in widening participation work more closely together? Can we get more of a, a multiplier effect and turn ourselves into more Albert Einsteins? Secondly, what type of partnerships should we be focusing on? If we have an immense possibility of collaborations, which ones should we really be picking? And finally, what is it that makes for strong and sustainable partnerships which might outlast shifts in political priorities? So why, first of all, um, Robert Winston's already given us the answer already, should we work more closely together? Uh, I think it's an immense strength of this sector that we all share a similar ideology and similar values. We all want the very best for the young people that we work with. And for their sakes, there are very clear imperative for us to target our resources as well as we can, to avoid duplicating unnecessarily our work, and to make sure that our work has a real impact. And it has to be said, there is an opportunity cost involved in widening participation. And some of that cost is actually borne by students. If we want to take students out of lessons, if we want to give teachers extra work, we have to make sure that what we're doing, our intervention, has real value. Thinking in just sort of purely sort of utilitarian economic terms, the Sutton Trust has done some fine work in showing us the economic value um, that social mobility can bring for us as a society. They estimate that gains in social mobility could lead to a gain of 2% in GDP, or £39 billion per year. I'm not sure if that was done pre or post Brexit. Um, if we look at the, questioning of the question of widening participation from a broader structural perspective, we can also see reasons to work together. When Tony Blair stood up in front of the Labour Party conference in 1999 and argued that 50% of students should go to university by 2010, he laid down a really difficult challenge. Just increasing the number of students going to higher education was not enough. We also had to try and increase the relative participation of students from disadvantaged groups. And not long after that pledge, and maybe one of the reasons I got so excited by that research that uh, Sam mentioned, I myself attended one of the very first wave of university summer schools, and I'm hugely grateful for the opportunity. And when I arrived at Cambridge, one of the first people I bumped into, was where I remember him very well, he was wearing his baggy t-shirt and a big grin, was Wesley Streeting. And Wes, some of you might know him, is now the Labour MP for Ilford North. And he continues to lead the fight in Parliament for underprivileged students. And I think as a real sort of poster boy and emblem of university widening participation activity, I think he's a great symbol of lasting social impact. But Wes aside, uh, when we look at how the picture and how the problem of widening participation has evolved over the, the last 20 years, we can see a somewhat mixed but optimistic picture. While progress has been made in the overall rate of young people going to higher education, we are all aware of the quite troubling gaps that remain in the progression of poorer and part-time students. And supporting students from disadvantaged groups to enter higher education is no easy matter. Doing some research and, and work around policy, it looks increasingly as if widening participation might enter that category of problems that two American academics, Horst Rittel and Melvin Weber, called wicked problems. And 
Weber and Rittle were actually city planners. They were interested in how you design a city best for its inhabitants. And they looked at these problems and they said that wicked problems have no kind of inherent difficulty attached to them, but they have a very special set of characteristics. Wicked problems have no agreed definition. They involve really sort of mind-bending interdependencies, and they, know, they offer no real obvious endpoint for judging success. And if we think about widening participation, I think true to form, it has become apparent that the exact goals of widening participation are hard to frame. If we start from the, the, the real basics, how to start with should we construct a target group of students? Is the best proxy of disadvantage where a young person lives, what type of school they go to, their household income, or their parents' social class? And because there's no settled definition, it's very hard for us to judge our progress. I'm really delighted to um, welcome Chris Millwood um, here from the Office for Students. And the Office for Students use a measure which you may, many of you in the audience will be familiar with called Polar, which looks across tiny little areas and measures their relative comparison rates. I've just got a little slide here. Um, if we look at this question in terms of local participation, these recent statistics from HESA, just concentrate on the dark brown because the, the methodology keeps changing. Um, so the brown ones are the one to compare. So we know that since 2010, the entry rates from the bottom fifth of neighbourhoods has risen slightly from 10 to 11.4%. In the last three years, it looks fairly static. If we wanted another way of framing the problem, we could go to the Department for Education numbers and the progress, the amazing progress that has been made for students who are in receipt of free school meals. What we see here is, a, look at this, this light blue, I think it's an incredible um, kind of wonderful uplift in the graph, which, should, which we, you know, so many people who've been working in this sector are responsible for. Um, we see more and more working um, students from sort of FSM backgrounds going to university. But we, what we can also see is that the gap between them and their non-FSM counterparts has stayed more or less the same. Now, theorists of wicked problems argue that they're never solved, but that the, really the best strategy for all the parties is to work together. And they're very, very clear that collaboration rather than competition is the way to make the most progress. And in the sector as a whole, I think we've had some really enlightened thinking um, from policy makers and from practitioners who went back right to the early days of AIM Higher, then we had the National Network of Collaborative Outreach, and now we have the National Collaborative Outreach Programme, or the NCOP. Um, but as well as being difficult to define, another characteristic of wicked problems is that they offer no closed set of solutions. There aren't a number of things you can do to try and solve it. If we want to improve access to HE and FE, there are any number of possible strategies which we could employ. And if we wanted just to sort of whip up some ideas amongst ourselves, we could think about mentoring students, engaging teachers, working with parents, or maybe conducting a national advertising campaign. Up until now, I think it's true to say, the vast majority of access work has focused on students and a fairly small set of activities which go all the way back to the earliest days of outreach and aim higher are still in use. And each year, amazing efforts go into campus trips, talks, mentoring, masterclasses, and subject enrichment. And while these activities are of great benefit, they share the same limitations. We all know, all of us involved in WP work, know that student-centered activities are tricky to target, they need frequent repetition, and they are difficult to evaluate. And at Causeway, we believe that as well as working with students, we need to put more emphasis on building partnerships and delivering interventions for teachers. And that belief has really been formed from our own experience in designing and delivering our first programme. When Sam and I had our sort of first initial idea for Causeway, we started by enlisting a group of academics and teachers. I was an academic at the time and Sam was a teacher and we saw that these two worlds, these two domains seemed very far apart. But from that initial group, everyone had a similar motivation. They had an interest which was professional and personal. And I think as professionals, 
we were all taken aback by the fact that some very significant investment had been put into this area, but that at the time, not a great deal seemed to be changing. And that piece of research that Sam mentioned was a piece of work by Professor Vicar Bolivar, who's based up at Durham University. And she looked at 10 years' worth of UCAS data, and she showed that when state school students got exactly the same grades as their counterparts in the private sector, they were still a third less likely to get a place at a leading university. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that research. There's one sort of quite bald finding. There's a lot of interesting sub-stories in there. But while we were all very professionally motivated by the problem, we were also urged on by more personal reasons. And each of us involved in founding this organisation were, to some degree, a product of the sort of new access generation. I don't know if Prince had a, a song for this. Um, we had attended schools and colleges which sent few students to universities, or we had been brought up in areas which we would now call low participation neighbourhoods. And in light of that research and that access gap which P Professor Bolivar had uncovered, we set up a programme called the Academic Apprenticeship and we f formed our first partnership with the Sutton Trust. We wanted to see whether we could strengthen the chances of talented but disadvantaged students by improving their applications. Because Pro Professor Bolivar's work had shown that if you control for grades, there's still a problem. And when we were first designing the Academic Apprenticeship, a lot of the discourse around personal statements in particular was focused on social and cultural capital. And the argument went that students in private schools got more chances for prestigious work experience and extracurricular activities. And I knew as an academic that that wasn't really going to impress me uh, as an admissions tutor. And so we took a slightly different approach and wanted to see that if we could boost the academic content of the personal statement, whether that would have make any difference. So we linked expert mentors. I think it's a really important point. There's so many different forms of intervention, so many great forms of mentoring, but for this one we wanted experts um, and we linked them together with this group of academic apprentices. apprentices. Um, we knew that attainment was the most important thing in terms of A-level and B-tech, so we wanted to put together a light-touch programme where students didn't have to come out of the classroom or they didn't have sort of an onerous set of duties. Um, and in order to kind of improve the evaluation and provide some comparative data, we work with students at Sutton Trust Summer Schools who met a recognised set of criteria for disadvantage and had similar levels of attainment and we could also put aside motivation bias because they were all wanted to come to these Sutton Trust Summer Schools. So we created two groups for evaluation. In the first we had this group who attended Sutton Trust Summer Schools and it's a great uh, privilege, like looking out and seeing co colleagues like uh, Doug Jennings from Bristol, who were there at the very, very start. Bristol, UCL and KCO, I think, were our first universities. Um, and those students went and participated in this academic apprenticeship scheme. In the second group, um, we had students who were at exactly the same summer schools, who had exactly the same attainment uh, levels, but we decided not to pick them because they went to schools which had higher progression rates. And all of the students in this uh, group who make up these statistics were applying for medicine, law and English. And we got Dr Stephen Jones from Manchester University to run an independent evaluation and the headline stats are here um, and he tracked this intervention through UCAS and every single one of the, this, th these academic apprentices got at least one offer from a Russell Group University and that compared with 73% in the comparison group. And at the time we thought, great, you know, fantastic. But as a researcher, I'm extremely sceptical of what we might call magic bullets, um, and we wanted to try and unpick what was happening, and actually, however wonderful these results were, and however happy we were to be able to make a real impact on these students, we found a secondary set of results, which I want to share with you today, and really, those students we've been working with, then when they went back to their schools in September, they reported to us through this e-mentoring scheme that their teachers had told them to remove the academic content from the personal statement. They said it was too long, essay-like and impersonal. And we wanted to see how widespread this problem was and so we got Steve Jones back and he took a set of personal statements and he gave them to a set of academics and a set of teachers. And the agreement was between the two parties was only in 23% of cases. 
And this disparity of thinking between teachers and academics, which we knew kind of instinctively from the start, attracted lots of interesting press coverage. Uh, my dad was really pleased to see uh, this reported in the Sun newspaper. Um, and my mum my actually reported that we had managed to penetrate that most powerful of social networks, mum's net. Um, the point of emphasising this disparity is certainly not to claim that teachers are the problem. We believe exactly the opposite. And we believe that working with teachers provides us with the very best opportunity to make further progress in widening participation. Claire Crawford has done some fantastic work on the importance of student attainment in driving progression. And if we couple her work with what we know from our work, it looks as if the real setting for improving students' chances is in the classroom. And we can run mentoring interventions, talks, campus visits, and we should continue to do so. It has a real effect. But we cannot escape the effect of grades or the support and advice that students are getting from their teachers. And I just want to illustrate the point by pointing to two students who I've named Martin and Robert in honour of our keynote speakers. Um, these are two students who we did some case studies with, and they're sort of fictional composites, but they tell quite a similar story. So I've put two together, two onion diagrams, and in them you can see the number of HE-based interactions which the two students have with parents, teachers, and university practitioners, respectively. And starting on your left is Martin. Martin comes from a low-income household where neither of his parents attended university. Martin and similar students report that while they have some conversations with their parents on things like student finance, they have many more HE conversations with teachers and that they tend to go for a sort of bright, a broader uh, range of topics such as subject choice and applications. And if we look at HE encounters for Martin, we can see he attended two campus trips and heard a talk from a university widening participation officer. Our next fictional student is Robert, who comes from a slightly more affluent household, and his father got a City and Guilds diploma after leaving school. And as you can see, there's a slight difference here, because Robert has more conversations than Martin with his parents, but the overall pattern is really, really clear, actually. That even if we were to double the number of university interactions, it wouldn't come close to the number of interactions that the two students have with parents and, importantly, with their teachers. And these are very simple numbers and they, they hide some very, very complex um, stories about the kind of quantity, the timing of interactions and the efficacy of those interactions for decision making. And one of the real experts in the field is uh, one of my colleagues called Johnny Rich from PUSH, who sent me some of his amazing work he's do been doing recently um, on IAG, which I hope is going to come out very soon. So we've got that very, very simple point to, to draw out. I want to go back to the role of teachers. Um, and for us, teachers are gatekeepers, they are facilitators, they are data holders, they are the structurers of student opportunities, and they are leaders within their institutions. And teachers are the people who can build on, catalyse and amplify the interactions of everyone who works in the WP sector. And we believe very strongly that in order to get the most out of the work we're doing, we need to equip teachers to act as real strategists for access. And our, our sort of dream is that one day we don't have to cast a sort of net every year and draw students in, but that there will be powerful forces pushing students towards HE. So if we acknowledge the importance of teachers, then the last of my questions to address is, what does a strong partnership between universities and schools look like? How, might we say, can we move from a marriage of convenience to a marriage of true minds? And when I was researching this speech at home, I spent some time looking at a variety of relationship and partnership gurus. Unfortunately, my wife shares the same laptop, and she started to get bombarded with marriage counselling adverts, and Google started suggesting to her questions like, what is going wrong with your marriage? <laughs> Uh, I had some explaining to do, and I'm thankful to say that the relationship survived, uh, and I can pass on some of my findings. But gurus in both management and, indeed, in the domestic sphere argue that the biggest imperative in any type of relationship 
is for partners to be responsive to each other's needs. And I think all of us know, all of us who work with schools and colleges know that rarely is post-18 destinations a school's top priority. They are struggling with Ofsted inspections, attainment, behaviour, everything else. So any intervention with teachers, if we're going to be responsive to their needs, has to actually make their work more efficient, has to decrease their workload and provide better ways of doing things. And just as we need to be responsive to teachers, we need to recognise the institutional complexities of schools and colleges. They all have different cultures, they have different power structures, and they have different politics. And every single one of us in this room might return to our institutions invigorated and want to make changes, but being able to do so is, is quite a different thing. So the final aspect of forming a great relationship, I think, in this sector, is to realise that while we are working with individuals, we also need to think about the underlying systems and the environment which surrounds them. And we researched the characteristics of high progression schools and looked again at our experience and data from the Academic Apprenticeship Programme. And to do so, we then developed a programme which we are calling Access Champions. And the key premise of this programme is that if we're going to make long-term sustainable changes to systems and practices in school, we need to get someone who has the power to make those changes, a lead teacher who can audit the current work and see what feasible changes can be made within that environment. And again, we looked at the, the sector as a whole and at careers, and there's some fantastic work being done uh, by the Gatsby Foundation using a benchmark approach. We've developed a set of benchmarks which sort of slot around the Gatsby benchmarks and help to sort of really drill down into uh, this question of HE encounters. And using a benchmark approach, schools are then able to audit their current systems and see what they want to, to do to progress. The Teacher Development Trust have done some really excellent work in pinpointing what it is that makes effective teacher training. And one of the key findings is that one-off events do not work. So to make real impact, teacher training needs to be sustained over an extended period. And that's why one of the, the key design features of the Access Champions programme is to make sure that there are four regional conferences and each half term one of our team goes in and talks to the lead teacher to make sure that the delivery plan is being worked through. As well as delivering change in systems, we are also aware of the need to give and provide some really strongly evaluated evidence of impact for targeted students. And so the Access Champions programme has two main parts. There's a structural change programme, and on top of that we have an intensive mentoring programme for targeted students. And the mentoring, again, we, we, we sort of stand by our philosophy of recruiting a really outstanding team of experienced educationists, some of them former head teachers and leaders of FE colleges, and I'm really happy that some of them are here today. So if we're going to bring this programme together and evaluate it, we have a kind of a range of weapons at our disposal. First of all, by looking through a benchmark lens, we are able to, to track indicators and inter of system change before, during and after the intervention. And then we can also, we've got some codified mentoring logs which help us to track some of the, the small stories or the, the themes which underlie the, the statistics. So we are currently delivering versions of Access Champions across the country. As Julie mentioned this morning, we're going to be doing some work in Scotland. I'm very uh, happy to welcome one of uh, our friends from Glasgow City Council who I was talking to this morning. Thank you for coming all the way. So from sponsoring schools to embedding HE representatives in schools and colleges, there are many models for engaging with teachers, of which Access Champions is only one. And as the theorists of partnerships tell us, there are actually costs to working together. There's more time needs to be spent and communication is difficult for all the partners. But we believe very strongly uh, that those costs are not only worth paying, but they are actually a very strong investment for future work. Real partnerships outlast policies. They help us to bring together our resources and our expertise to make a true difference for the students we work with. And if we really want to solve this wicked problem of widening participation, we believe we need to work more closely together.
Thank you very much.